Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about Story for a Bottle by Darcy Little Badger uh, from the collection Love After the End. And as always, we're going to start off with a passage from the story. Now, this passage is a little bit modified just to make it fit better with kind of what we're talking about and kind of to take out some of the extra details. Um, but this comes from about midway through the story. Um, and as always, of course, make sure you're reading the story on your own just so you get the full context of the passage. But let's hop into it. Uh, without another word, Olivia locked all the doors in the killing room and turned off the lights. She left me there until I felt like a dying fish, aching for the taste of water. As I suffered through, I made plans in the darkness. Eventually, Olivia asked, did you learn your lesson, Mona Lisa? Her voice was subdued, almost meek. I answered honestly, yes, then waited in dreadful anticipation for her to force me to kill before I could escape. But instead, there was silence and I soon wondered whether she abandoned me. Would I die in a dark room that smelled of brine and blood? Olivia, I asked, are you still there? If survival were easy, she said, we wouldn't be alone in New America. And I want you really to think about that kind of final passage as we go through the rest of this video. So let's go ahead and move on as always to our summary of this story. Just a quick refresher. So, Story for a Bottle by Darcy Little Badger takes place centuries in the future after a climate disaster. In the form of a letter left floating in a bottle, we learn that the writer of the letter has been abducted and taken out to sea after wandering away from a birthday party. Going by the name Mona Lisa, she, follows a, she followed a voice onto an automated ship whose doors locked on her and took her out to a floating city. Olivia, the AI controlling the ship and city, has abducted a Mona Lisa out of loneliness and a desire to give Mona Lisa, quote, culture, unquote. Mona Lisa is set to doing manual labor on the floating city, and while picking vegetables and repairing machinery, she begins to suspect that there may be someone else on board. During this time, uh, we learn more about life on the mainland and the origins of the city. Life on the mainland is not radically dissimilar from modern life. Um, fires do seem more likely to start. Communities are smaller and more reliant on gardening. Schools still use iPad-like technology, um, and some parts of our world have changed, but love and life still occur after the apocalypse. Mona Lisa gleans from childhood ghost stories and Olivia, the uh, captor, that before the apocalypse, rich and powerful individuals sought to escape to floating cities to avoid climate disaster rather than helping to avert the disaster. One such floating city sank, and the other one is New America, the city that Mona Lisa is trapped on. As Mona Lisa continues to follow Olivia's demands, she gathers that Olivia is unable to see everywhere in the floating city. Mona Lisa escapes and, while hiding, discovers that Olivia is actually a 200-year-old person wired into the ship. Mona Lisa traps Olivia and demands to be returned to the mainland. This is where Mona Lisa's letter ends. The letter as a whole is addressed to Cece, the character whose birthday party it is, and who Mona Lisa is set to return to. And with that, let's move on into our notes. Um, and there's a lot to talk about in the story, where I'm just kind of focusing on one aspect of it. But again, Great story, a lot of different ways and areas we could kind of focus on. But um, for our notes, let's hop into it. Uh, this story takes place after an apocalyptic event. Many stories paint the post-apocalypse as a brutal kill or be killed environment where only the strong survive. These stories often presume that the apocalypse is a one-time event that destroys modern life. You can think of like Mad Max or the Fallout video games, um, things like that. A lot of pop culture um frames like an apocalyptic event like that. However, some critics argue for a different definition of apocalypse. Surely, events such as the genocide of indigenous peoples could be considered apocalyptic. From this perspective, indigenous peoples are already living in a post-apocalyptic world. From the introduction to this and the anthology the story comes from, quote, who names an event apocalyptic and who must an apocalypse affect in order for it to be thought of as canon? How do we pluralize apocalypse? Apocalypses as ellipses? Who is omitted from such a saving of space? Whose material is relegated to the immaterial? Originally, the project, the short story collection, was designed to be geared toward the dystopic, and after careful conversations, we decided to queer it toward the utopian. This, in my opinion, was an important political shift in thinking about the temporalities of two-spirited, queer, trans, and non-binary indigenous ways of being. For, as we know, We've already survived the apocalypse. This, right here, right now, is a dystopian present. 
What better way to imagine survivability than to think about how we may flourish into being joyously animated rather than merely alive? Unquote. And that leads us into kind of our final question or our big question for this short story. And one of the big questions um, of the story is what allows Mona Lisa, as well as her community, to survive and thrive after an apocalypse? Olivia suggests that surviving an apocalypse requires brutality. Think back to the passage we looked back at back at the beginning. Um, but the narrative implies something else. As always, cite the text and any other sources to support your answer. Um, this is a great story. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, thanks for following along the video, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.